स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Welcome back to NPTEL, the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning. These lectures are being brought to you by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science. We have already um, been in two lectures and uh, which were introductory in nature describing delineating um, the framework, the scope of cultural studies. Uh, today, we move into the beginning of what would be uh, a couple of lectures devoted to the scientific analysis of culture, looking at how, um, uh, looking at what the scientific approach or findings from science could have to tell us about culture and how we may harness those findings. Uh, in order to make or on, in order to enrich the field of cultural studies. Well, let us look at what we did in the last lecture by way of a brief recap. You will remember that the last lecture was part two of understanding cultural studies and when we talked about cultural studies, we found a very interesting formulation by Chris Barker. Whereas, in you know, in usually, you know, we go about defining something. For instance, what is sociology? What is biology? What is physics? What is anthropology, etc. Barker, Chris Barker, whose text cultural studies theory and practice is the key text um, among other texts that we are going to use in these series of um, virtual classes. We found that Barker says that one of the ways by which we may highlight the differences is by rephrasing the question what is cultural studies. So, this is a non-essentialist way of trying to delineate the scope of something. So, instead of asking what is cultural studies, which will according to Barker and many other critics will never really give us you know an idea a full idea of what we do in cultural studies. He says that instead we need to ask alternative questions like how do we talk about cultural studies, what are the purposes of cultural studies and where, where are the purposes sorry the practices of cultural studies located. So, this is what we had discussed in detail in the last lecture. Then again we looked at another statement by Barker where he says that cultural studies is not only interdisciplinary, but also post disciplinary. Right? And we saw that there is the blurring of boundaries among different domains is not just by happenstance, but is or th there is a willing you know breaking down of boundaries between itself and other domains, hence it is post disciplinary. Then Barker also says that there is no claim to originality in cultural studies, uh, all that we look for here are the forming of new patterns and ways of seeing. Then we also found that cultural studies draws you know um, findings from different disciplines right selectively because its main focus is to examine the relations of culture and power right and this main focus is not the study of culture you remember in the first lecture we that discussed this that uh, contemporary cultural studies is differentiated from the so called traditional or conventional way uh, of doing cultures uh, you know uh, studies of culture which is called the study of culture uh, in the sense that it doesn't look at different practices in an essential or, or essentialist or ontological manner, what it does is it tries to understand every cultural form, every cultural practice, right? 
uh, for instance, that anthropology may give us, uh, and it subjects all these findings to one. Sing, sing, you know, uh, one singular you may say question is what is the relationship between all these cultural forms, practices, etcetera, and power, right. So, this is we found in the last lecture that this is one of you know the uh, ways in which contemporary cultural studies or the way we are doing cultural studies focuses on knowledge. Next, also we also found through Barker and then we read from Barker's text in that the forms of power that cultural studies explores are diverse and include gender, race, class, colonialism etcetera and that cultural studies seeks to explore the connections. Look at this word again, right. It is not only the forms and practices of, of uh, you know culture, but also the connections between these forms and of uh, forms of power and thirdly. Okay, this is another important point that we found in the scope of cultural studies or in the you know purpose of cultural studies is that uh, cultural studies practitioners do not stop right they do not stop simply at you know showing the connections but also all these things are harnessed for the pursuit of change so we also saw that it has a clear political agenda okay the agenda is twofold a to show the relation uh, of you know between power and all other cultural forms and practices and b to use you know the findings while showing the relation uh, among these uh, to to uh, you know to pursue change right so we need to keep this in mind as we will go on to other uh, topics then cultural studies also has a great therapeutic value okay this is one aspect that is also you know uh, brought to our uh, notice or also uh, quite strongly reiterated by Chris Barker in another text by him which is making sense of cultural studies right. Therein he um, and also in you know in cultural studies theory and practice he talks about the therapeutic value of doing cultural studies and we had seen in one of the lectures before this that even you know rephrasing a question right. Uh, rephrasing conventional questions which are um, which are imbued with structures of power you know when we rephrase them when you ask a question in a different way that itself is a an act of challenging power and b a potential of therapeutic value okay so we will on uh, in and now in some other lecture look at this point in more detail Fine. So, the key source texts in the lecture today are these Chris Barker, Barker's Cultural Studies Theory and Practice, David Buss, the, uh, the Handbook of Evolutionary Psychology, E. O. Wilson on Human Nature, uh, and also I will refer to sociobiology by him, and Lida Kosmides and John Tooby's Evolutionary Psychology. A primer. Now, obviously, these are no by no means you know the only text that uh, with which you can build you know a lecture. But obviously, you know in uh, when time you know uh, time is short and we have to talk about you know issues, talk about um, to, you know topics, concepts within a single lecture. Then we have to, uh, you know it is imperative for us to uh, to you know bring just a few books okay to your notice. So, what is the topic of discussion today? The topic of discussion today is evolution and culture. Remember, we uh, we talked about the scope of cultural studies. We talk about various aspects of cultural studies is interdisciplinary and as others would say post disciplinary nature. Uh, now, what I am going to do or we are going to do is we are going to, to devote about 3 to 4 lectures right to uh, as I said what science has to uh, you know to offer us as far as throwing light on culture uh, is concerned and in that we are going to choose a field known as evolution okay you are as students of science and technology uh, quite well acquainted with Charles Darwin's theory of evolution of the principle of natural selection of adaptation of survival right. So, why we are doing this is um, 
really it uh, you know it, it takes us back again to the to a question of epistemology right what was epistemology as we found in the first lecture epistemology is uh, uh, is a branch of philosophy that deals with you know the theory of knowledge with the origin the you know the the limits of knowledge in a sense how is knowledge possible and within what boundaries right so we may have different epistemologies for instance uh, many you know, people say that uh, you know getting knowledge through religion to you know maybe one is one of the ways you know uh, we we through scriptures that we get knowledge but we uh, are choosing to speak from the point of view of science from the point of view of evolution um, one of the may you know reasons being obviously <coughs> that science works right that uh, findings are uh, findings from science are put to the test are put to replicability okay and um, you know even if many people say that science too is just a domain okay uh, science, uh, science too can be uh, is, is incomplete as a source of knowledge I believe that this is the best that we have. So, uh, we will begin by quoting from Chris Barker and Barker in his book cultural studies uh, gives a uh, gives a warning that uh, you know uh, we need to heed he says cultural studies that is cultural studies as a discipline has suffered by sealing itself off from the empirical rigors of science and the embodied nature of human beings. This is extremely important okay let us look at this what the rigors of science okay what uh, science has to offer us has been hitherto you know shut out by practitioners of cultural studies thinking that we are doing only humanities and social sciences and that we need not look at or need not be as rigorous right as the sciences are, but that is false right that is, a, that is an illusion that we have and Barker says that it is important for us to be as rigorous as the sciences in a in the sense that in, in which the humanities and sciences uh, social sciences allow us to be rigorous and then he says the embodied nature of human beings okay the fact that we have a body the fact that we we are embodied our brains and minds are embodied from and from the embodied mind uh, stems culture, culture and forms cultural practices. So, he says that if we do not uh, you know keep these two things in mind we you know then in that in that, uh, that sense or in that case cultural studies also would be a very uh, would be a poorer it would be poorer as a field. So, he says therefore, it is important for us to adopt uh, adopt some new strains these were strains which were not really available in uh, available in cultural studies when it began right. So, uh, that is the reason why we are you know adding a few lectures on uh, you know from the findings of science and he says that we should adopt the languages of evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology. Uh, we should also put the findings to use as far as psychotherapy is concerned, so that cultural studies is of therapeutic value also of pragmatic use, which might ultimately lead to a different kind of spirituality, a meaningful spirituality, which emerges not from the traditional religious spirituality that uh, you know some, uh, some practice, but with a spirituality that uh, almost paradoxically uh, uh, you know is possible through the findings of science and in the over the last uh, uh, two three or four lectures we are going to find out how this is possible. So, uh, we found that Barker clearly says that there are two uh, lacunae or gaps okay, in, uh, in, a, in so far as uh, cultural studies has been practiced over the years and as you remember these two lacunae are that the empirical rigors of science okay, are missing from cultural studies and an increasing awareness of the embodied nature of human beings is something that too is missing from the formulations of, um, of cultural studies. Okay. So, 
uh, we will look before going into evolution, evolutionary psychology proper, we are going to look at uh, you know a school of thought that arose with a scholar named E. O. Wilson, who is supposed to uh, or who is well known as far as the domain of sociobiology is concerned. Let me also remind you that sociobiology uh, is not without its controversies. Okay? Many uh, uh, scholars have ceased sort of doing sociobiology and moved on to the you know the more sort of uh, many be, as many be believe politically correct field of evolutionary psychology. Um, but why I am bringing E. O. Wilson here is uh, in a bit a to show the contrast and again to, to show that there is there was after all in sociobiology and uh, you know and uh, an effort okay, to throw light on the social you know through the biological right. So, let us read from uh, E. O. Wilson. According to Wilson human behaviors are unlikely to change in any fundamental way. Okay. Uh, in, in that sense, we you know the entire human race, all of us as part of the human race, right, uh, then have some fundamental characteristics in us, which no matter how sophisticated, how complex or complicated culture becomes, these are these fundamental traits are there to stay. Okay. So, these are a tendency toward uh, toward hierarchy. Okay, maintaining a hierarchical status, be it in families, be it in um, you know in uh, in institutions, be in, be it in you know places of work, right? Uh, this may today sound a little you know uh, incorrect in the sense that there is, uh, of course, we have made efforts to minimize okay hierarchies, and we have uh, you know um, uh, very very radical or very a kind of overt hierarchical systems are not systems that uh, you know um, are preferred in a you know in a in, uh, in a in a culture in a general sense but we also have to agree right that there is after all however you know reducing it is today it there is after all a tendency towards hierarchy in human beings then a tendency toward an emphasis upon and a deep personal concern about status and recognition right this is this too is something that uh, is common to the entire human race right no matter where we live then a great value placed individually upon self esteem as part of individual integrity. Okay. So, self esteem sorry self esteem is then another fundamental trait as Wilson has shown us. So, um, it is not however, that Wilson and sociobiology okay, uh, come upon these findings only from a so called social perspective. Right. So, behind this is the observation from a biological perspective. Then again Wilson says that there is a desire for personal privacy including private space, there is a deep sexual bonding and deep parental bonding right, which, which have complex manifestations in our cultural life. There is an aversion to incest and there is a tribalism of some kind. So, these are uh, further additional you know fundamental characteristics that Wilson brings home to us. Then he also um, you know also pointed to the following, he said that culture is created in his words culture is created by the communal mind and each mind is the product of the genetically structured human brain genes and culture are therefore, inseverably linked. So, you know the, the fact that you know linking genes to culture linking again culture to a communal mind communal here in the sense of community okay, not in the negative sense of communal of community that is a collective let us say a collective mind and that this collective mind uh, is, in ter in, is, is a product of gen the genetically structured human brain and that therefore, genes and you know genes and culture are inseverably linked. Then Wilson also said that the mind grows from birth to death by absorbing parts of the existing culture available to it. Okay. 
uh, with selections guided through epigenetic rules inherited by the individual brain. So, you see uh, even in Wilson's schema, even in Wilson's formulations we find uh, you know that biology becomes the you know the reference point from which you know we try to understand culture, we are try to understand culture through, through genes, okay, through genetic inher inheritance right and we try to understand culture as created by a communal mind and each mind okay, is one that is a product of a genetically structured human brain. Um, in general you know the study of the scientific study of culture okay, from uh, an evolutionary perspective would give us um, a few very important points and let us look at this slide here. Um, what we had in the past, okay, this is important, what or the way in which we evolved in the past, okay, the way that we are today, there is not uh, there is not a great deal of difference as far as you know what Winsel called the fundamental traits are concerned. Okay. Uh, all these now let us look at these points, all these points are you will agree um, you know characteristics that we have today which have not left us today and which are there for uh, you know since the time we evolved as a species right. For instance, predator avoidance, now the forms may be different different right. Uh, the, the predator animals for instance that were sought to be avoided in the past right may have gone in extinct. Okay. The uh, uh, predating or, uh, or uh, sorry uh, predators may take different forms and not necessarily an only animals on, okay, animals that threaten our lives. However, as a characteristic the propensity to avoid predators is something that is still with us and something that is still very strong in us right. It is some it is uh, not simply uh, you know just a legacy. Okay, it has continued through thousands of years of evolution and importantly it is common to all human beings. Right? Second habitat selection, again the same uh, you know argument may apply here, habitat selec selection is something that was done in the past okay, and is something that is done both individually and you know collectively by human beings right. The selection of habitat is immensely important, it has to be conducive to the uh, you know the survival and growth and development of a particular community. Next mate selection, okay. mate selection which is important for you know one of the two pillars of evolutionary theory okay, which is uh, reproduction, survival being the other uh, other pillar of evolutionary uh, theory. Mate selection again is you know is uh, something that has come to us from the past and something has that has remained with us as a fundamental characteristic. After that reciprocal altruism, now reciprocal altruism uh, or you know what altruism is, what is altruism? Altruism is a propensity or is a characteristic uh, the, uh, you know, in uh, you know, which we have, in which there is, uh, you know, um, we have the propensity of helping others, okay, or of doing altruistic deeds, for instance, right? Reciprocal altruism is a theory, um, or you know, then the the best proponent of this theory, or the most well-known person in this theory, well-known name here is uh, um, R. L. Trivers, right? So reciprocal altruism, that is. Uh, you know you receive you know uh, you uh, uh, you know compared to pure altruism okay where you uh, you perform a deed of kindness or perform a deed of even sacrifice without look, you know without really uh, wanting or expecting you know similar deed in return in reciprocal altruism right uh, it seems that reciprocal altruism is uh, it has been there since you know since the past since thousands of years uh, which is uh, also something that is there with us, right? Even if it is not pure altruism, okay? Doing a good deed or altruistic de deed uh, with also, okay, the expectation of a reciprocation. Then parental investment. Parental investment um, is also another fundamental characteristic that 
science uh, you know scientific studies of societies of human beings okay have particularly evolutionary theory uh, has brought, brought to the fore in this is also something that has been with us and uh, is a characteristic we have in the present as well as something that we had in the past. Finally, coalition that is forming coalitions or forming groups forming um, some sort of uh, an understanding okay, for you know doing, doing work together right forming coalitions uh, is also definitely you will realize is a characteristic that has that is with us and is also part of our evolutionary legacy. Now, the, it does not mean that we have you know um, six about six points now it does not mean uh, that these are by you know on the only fundamental traits that we have right. We have several other traits which has been brought to us by uh, you know by scholars like David Buss for instance about whom we will be speaking in a while, but this is just to give you an example that you know um, there are deep structures in us and the, those deep structures are there uh, you know very fundamentally uh, with us and you know one of the reasons one of the ways or one of the explanatory frameworks for this is the theory the framework of evolutionary psychology uh, which we will begin to talk about in a while and the next lecture is devoted solely to evolutionary psychology. Therefore, we now see that the biocultural perspective right the biocultural perspective is a perspective which we need to you know which we need to incorporate into the study of culture you know in the last two lectures you may have you know may have after the last two lectures you may have thought that well the cultural studies is something to do always to do with you know uncertainty always to do with uh, you know no uh, you know uh, no no knowledge is um, you know uh, complete the knowledge is always provisional everything is a matter of science and signifying practices okay uh, it would remain I would think the poorer as, as when Barker, Barker had, had, had uh, pointed out it would remain the poorer and you know uh, it would remain a domain which is forever talking only about uncertainties uh, had it not incorporated uh, the biological element. So, we need to add the biocultural perspective and the a re relatively new field of study which is evolutionary psychology, psychology based on evolution and biology right on evolutionary biology in particular. Uh, this is a field that has come up and has been incorporated or uh, uh, you know in a, in, a, in a very successful interdisciplinary manner uh, you know findings or have been drawn by theorists about uh, you know about the deep structures which ultimately give rise to culture. So, what is evolutionary psychology? We get this point from you know scholars like David Buss right and I am reading from David Buss and his handbook on evolutionary psychology right. So, this is what Buss has to say. Evolutionary psychology is an approach to the study of psychology that is informed by modern principles of evolutionary biology. Look at this term an approach to the study of psychology and as we shall see uh, in a while okay, evolutionary psychology is not really considered a branch of psycholo psychology so much as it is considered an approach okay, and we shall explain this in a while an approach to the study of psychology that has or draws this information or that uh, you know uh, whose main tenets are or whose main theoretical foundations are informed by another uh, you know field of study which is called evolutionary biology right. How did the human body evolve okay, uh, what are the different um, organs devoted to what, what uh, kind of processing or what functions are the different um, you know organs in the human body um, devoted to and how did they evolve and why did they evolve uh, to the you know uh, uh, to the stage in which they are what was the need what were the selection pressures right. So, uh, you know um, in contrast to sort of uh, in contrast to conventional if I may use the word conventional biology that you may study in uh, your schools and colleges evolutionary biology tries to find out how 
okay, the human body evolved over time and what were the selection pressures that caused the you know these changes in evolution in the first place. So, let me read again from David Bass. And approach to the study of psychology that is informed by modern principles okay, by modern principles of evolutionary biology an approach to exploring the mechanisms of the mind not a branch of psychology. Remember we also we uh, talked about this no it is not a branch of psychology, but a lens a lens through which any psychological phenomenon can be examined right. So, any psychological phenomenon uh, be it uh, our fear and flight responses for instance, be it obsessive disorders for instance, okay, be it cases of you know um, uh, cases of socio or psychopathology for instance. Okay. Uh, Bus and other practitioners of evolutionary psychology say that it is uh, it is a it is an approach you know to psychology that could can throw light light on any any psychological phenomenon in human beings. This is you may think a uh, quite a tall order or very tall claim, right? but the beauty of this field lies in the fact that cu even cultural you know practices, cultural forms are uh, not just uh, you know our psychology, our you know uh, areas of cultural psychology for instance, okay, why we bond in certain ways. Right? Why we form groups? Why we have this? Why we have coalitions? Why we in, do we invest so much? You know, in in uh, issues of parenting. Right? So uh, um, these are issues that will, or it is claimed, can be answered by the field of evolutionary psychology. Okay. So again, follow, uh, follow, following Bus again. Let's read from him. According to David Bus, all behavior is a function of psychological mechanisms plus the input to those mechanisms right all psychological mechanisms at some basic level this is important originate from evolutionary processes okay psychological mechanisms that we have today okay are mechanisms which have you know served some purpose in our evolutionary history okay and that is why at least the core psychological mechanisms for fear for instance, anger for instance, okay, joy, love for instance, these core psychological propensities in us, they originate from evolutionary processes and they have served as I said had served um, some very important, um, important um, um, functions in the past in our evolutionary past and still do perform those important functions and that is why we have not got rid of them. Okay, they are there and they have originated in evolutionary processes. So much so that evolutionary psychologists say that if we did not develop those psychological mechanisms at least our core psychological mechanisms, okay, we would never have survived as a species. Then the next point the third point made by David Buss here is I am quoting natural and uh, sexual selection are the most important evolutionary processes responsible for creating psychological mechanism. Now, conventional ways of looking at evolution would would you know many of many people would say that well oh it is got to do with you know our standing erect is got to do with changing from you know um, uh, a stage in which we were like apes right changing into a stage in which we are standing erect. One thing it is important to remember here is that apes are, are not our ancestors. Okay. Apes and chimpanzees are our cousins. The point is uh, there was a common ancestor okay, in evolution and we uh, you know we sort of we sort of drifted away from the common ancestor because of selection pressures right and the best uh, sort of story or narrative about this okay which is backed by scientific findings which is backed by uh, paleo um, anthropology okay which is our paleontology the study of fossils is that we uh, the human species homo sapiens right um, originated 
in eastern Africa following a geological change. This is what I will explain to you in the next uh, lecture. So, natural and sexual selection are you know, what is a drive right or uh, why we, we create psychological mechanisms in order to survive right but what is the force is it some supernatural force because which which determines the fact is it some god that determines you know uh, what kind of psychological processes you and i are going to have as a species and uh, these scholars say no it is natural and sexual selection okay which give rise or have given rise to certain psychological processes that all of us have in common so what is evolutionary psychology evolutionary psychology is a is an approach to psychology okay to give us reasons for the psychological uh, mechanisms that we have at least the core psychological mechanisms that we have and also the disorders that we have these can be explained by this branch known as evolutionary psychology and the inspiration behind evolutionary psychology is another branch known as evolutionary biology both evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology you know uh, the the you know you say the whole epistemology behind it is that in the case of both biology and psychology the kind of bodies that we have and the kind of minds that we have are those that have served some purpose okay, in evolution and that is why you know these are very important mutations, very important changes, adaptations the, the, as the word given to us by Charles Darwin, adaptations that we have retained in us. Okay. So, anything contemporary is to be answered by invoking our evolutionary history or lineage. So, uh, the uh, we again look at the dictionary of psychology. Now, you know we remember we talked about uh, E O Wilson and sociobiology and I said that it is different sociobiology is different from evolutionary psychology. Now, as given to us by the APA dictionary of psychology the difference is this evolutionary psychology differs from sociobiology mainly in its emphasis right emphasis on the effects of natural selection on information processing and the structure of the human mind right now look at this evolutionary the the uh, you know the this the you could say the the motivation or you know um, the ground sort of you know the ground is the same or even the way of looking at things uh, uh, you know way of looking and trying to explain uh, our socio cultural processes okay these may have there may be common grounds between sociobiology and um, evolutionary psychology, but the important difference between sociobiology and evolutionary psychology is that is on the emphasis okay. evolutionary psychology emphasizes okay, the effects that you know it, 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 it gives us both the explanation that you know and the emphasis on natural selection okay, on Darwinian natural selection on the human mind on both the information processing units in the human mind okay, and on the structure of the human mind. Okay. So, in a while we shall see uh, this in more detail. So, variation uh, change inheritance in, in a situation of high rate of population and growth and differential survival okay, and reproduction that is surviving and reproducing because you have a differential in you something that differentiates you from those that perished right because you retained one retained the uh, you know the characteristic that um, was was chosen for in adaptation um, in uh, by natural selection because it led to the survival of the species these kind of words are what we will find in evolution not only in evolution but also in evolutionary psychology okay Therefore, I am reading again uh, this time from you know the similar to just to show you how they converge on you know or they agree with uh, you know uh, agree on the motivation or agree on the goal of evolutionary psychology. This is by Tubi and Cosmides and we will take up Tubi and Cosmides text in more detail in the next lecture, but simply reading from their primer on evolutionary psychology this is what they have to say and I am quoting them the goal of research in evolutionary psychology is to discover and understand the design of the human mind. 
evolutionary psychology is an approach to psychology in which knowledge and principles from evolutionary biology are put to use in research on the structure of the human mind. You see there is so much of similarity okay, between the way David Buss has formulated this and Tooby and Cosmides have formulated this. Therefore, what is the goal? of evolutionary psychology or, or studying even studying evolution and culture in a general sense. The goal is to discover and to understand uh, how the human mind has been designed and structured and remember uh, how the human mind and has been designed and structured one of the uh, key or core, uh, core foundational statements or premises here without which we cannot have evolutionary psychology is that the human mind has been structured, it has been designed by one force and that force is the force of natural selection as was given to us by Charles Darwin. Okay. So, the goal of evolutionary psychology is to find out okay, how the human mind has been designed of what, what the structures are, how it has been structured not by some supernatural agent like uh, a god for instance okay, nor by aliens, right? uh, but by the slow process of changes that occur in us um, in, bo in our minds because of the pressures of natural selection. So, Again, as uh, Tubi and Cosmides have said, it is not an area of study like vision, reasoning or social behavior as psychology, they may have different branches of psychology, but it is a way of thinking about psychology that can be applied to any topic within it. So, you can apply it to you know to understand why uh, you know some people fear of spiders when they should uh, as compared to automobiles when they should be fearing automobiles more than spiders because the chances of being ha hurt by an automobile are more than being hurt by a spider okay? or certain uh, you know psychosomatic um, diseases for instance or certain disorders or even our so called normal psychological propensities are things that can be explained. Okay, each of these can be explained the claim is made by evolutionary psychology. So, in this view I am just reading it now from Tubi and Cosmides, but I shall be taking it or unpacking this in the next lecture. In this view that is in the view given to us by evolutionary psychology the mind is a set of information processing machines okay, that were designed by natural selection this much we have known. But the most important thing is that these were designed not for our present day purposes. These were designed by the force of natural selection to solve adaptive problems, okay, certain kinds of problems which are known as adaptive problems and these problems are problems not faced only by us. These problems are those that were faced by our hunter gatherer ancestors. So, it is always okay, evolutionary psychology is always or the study of culture from the purpose of evolution. Okay. Um, this is uh, you know uh, uh, this is always something which is not forward looking. In fact, you have a term for it the analogy is reverse engineering as you have in your engineering and technology okay, going back from the final product. Right. So, we also try to understand the current mind that we have Okay, the current design and structure of our brains and minds by invoking you know the functions that these units performed in our evolutionary past. So, this way of thinking about the brain to be and Cosmides say mind and behavior is changing how scientists approach old topics and of opening up new ones. So, as we have seen the mind is a set therefore, the mind that creates culture is a set of information processing machines designed by natural selection to solve adaptive problems that were faced by our hunter gatherer ancestors. Okay. We also saw that evolutionary psychology is an approach to psychology in which knowledge and principles from evolutionary biology are used to do research on the structure of the human mind. So, um, Barker therefore, and I will be summing up by using Barker's words, Barker therefore, says that you know it is it is 
important that we 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 make it possible okay that cultural studies makes it possible or to enable an alliance we call this an alliance of evolutionary theory and cultural studies okay we need to deconstruct the opposition of nature and culture from both directions so you know one of the reasons why i brought this to you uh, you know is that um, we think like we think about the humanities and social sciences in you know uh, in a schema of binary opposition to science and technology for instance that this is completely different from the other it is very important for, for us to break such binaries to you know to break such boundaries and cultural studies being you know one of perhaps one of the most interdisciplinary subjects that you can ever come across okay is even going to you know uh, going to invoke uh, you know areas like science like biology uh, etc in a bid to throw light on 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 the kind of, of the you know uh, beings that we are and the kind of complex um, evolved organisms that we are right so that is why barker says that there is a necessity to form an alliance okay uh, to form a healthy alliance of evolutionary theory and cultural studies so that we may deconstruct or we may dismantle this division between nature and culture that nature is different from culture no the point being made by these scientists is that, is that culture feeds into nature and nature feeds into culture and that is why we say the biocultural perspective is a perspective without which we would be well floating okay in this whole field of signifying practices not being able to offer any explanatory framework for as to why we have you know certain cultural propensities in the first place right so, Barker goes on to say culture is an outgrowth of human beings learning and adapting within their natural ancestral environment. On the other, not only is nature already a concept in language, we may also speak about the socialization of nature. Okay, so, as culture is also you know uh, feeds on nature, right? Nature we have to understand is uh, you know when we begin to talk about nature okay when we theorize nature when we conceptualize nature that we have to remember is one that is done through language okay when it's done through discourse right these are words you'll come come across in other lectures you know uh, to follow and we therefore have uh, even nature is not sort of pristine nature is not something that we uh, are uh, cannot uh, comprehend the comprehension of nature is done through the socialization of nature through language more about this in lectures to follow um, therefore we find let's come to the discussion now okay now if you get a question like name two lacunae in a cultural studies approach that does not include the evolutionary perspective or you can rephrase it name two lacunae that uh, that um, sort of uh, were found in cultural studies of the early phase for instance. Okay. So, these two lacunae are ones in say that have, have been pointed out by Chris Barker and these are that cultural studies uh, hitherto did not have the empirical rigors of science you know and uh, did not give much attention to the embodied nature of human beings so, that is the biocultural perspective was a was a huge lacuna in cultural studies then how is the mind defined within evolutionary psychology the mind in evolutionary psychology is defined as a set of information processing machines that have been designed by natural selection to solve adaptive problems faced by a hunter gatherer ancestors what is the goal of evolutionary psychology? The goal of evolutionary psychology is to discover and understand the human mind, especially the design of the human mind and the structure of the human mind. How not as I said by, uh, by, a, by an appeal to some supernatural a, uh, agent or uh, by you know aliens, but by an appeal to a process of evolution, a process of uh, you know um, a uh, process of changes driven by a principle called natural selection. 
Okay, what issues are addressed by evolutionary psychology that are useful for cultural studies? Okay, this is important. I uh, I just missed this point, but I, we can discuss this as a question, uh, the answer to a question. Uh, the what was our question? What issues are addressed by evolutionary psychology that are useful for cultural studies? Now there may be certain um, uh, you know um, aspects of culture. Okay, like the comparison between males and females, then food acquisition and selection. For instance, why we like spices. These are points given by David Buss in his book, Sex Differences in Special, Specific Spatial Abilities, Fears, Phobias, and Anxieties, and Evolutionary Memories, and Suicide. The aspect of suicide, okay, which is really a paradox. If one is uh, driven or one is designed, so to speak, to survive, then how do we explain anomalies like? Uh, suicide. Okay. So, these are some of the things that uh, can be explained or could be explained these are cultural aspects, these are cultural practices which, uh, which are these, these are again the socio cultural psychological elements that we possess. All these can be explained by uh, certain deep structures that we have. These structures explain all this all right, but deep such deep structures can also explain things which we might think are completely cultural in nature, okay, certain forms and practices, but these deep structures are eventually as evolutionary psychologists would argue uh, the reasons why we have certain cultural forms and arrangements. Okay. So, this was an introduction to how we may use science uh, particularly biology and in biology particularly the theory of evolution as was given to us initially by Charles Darwin and how scholars like David Buss. Um, and uh, Tubi and Cosmides and many others have used okay, how they have used uh, uh, the, the main premises uh, and theories to, to argue that many of our psychosocial and psycho, uh, you know cultural propensities uh, if at all we ever want and we should want an, a clear rational explanatory framework for these, it is only evolutionary psychology that can understand it. Now, it is not you know to say that what we discuss in the first two lectures in this module that, that these are uh, you know uh, these are not, uh, not useful that all you know because the point you have to understand is even evolutionary psychology is couched in language. Okay evolutionary psychology also uses signs, uses signifying practices, okay, uses the tools of science. This is the beauty of cultural studies. On the one hand, you accept the fact that there are explanations for culture and at the same time, you put these very explanations to the tests of cultural studies by saying that these are also discourses. There is no clear cut answer to it. What we have found here is that yes, we can have an explanatory framework, but it again does not do away with the core pre presumption or sorry core premise of cultural studies okay, that everything is a discourse right and things these are signifying practices even as we begin to talk with so much confidence about uh, things like evolution, things like evolutionary psychology and biology. Thank you for now and in the next lecture we are going to really unpack this further when we talk about the principles of evolutionary psychology. Thank you for now.